Yes, I started it. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome again to this um, our agriculture training webinar. I warmly welcome you to this free and virtual agriculture training webinar, module six on root crop cultivation. It is organized by the Public Service Credit Union Cooperative Society. My name is Michelle Shah, agricultural engineer with 26 years of technical experience and engineering solutions. During these unprecedented times caused by COVID-19, we, the members of PSCU, are doubling our efforts to engage the public by harnessing digital technologies to bring training and development capacity initiatives to a much wider listening and viewing audience and to benefit from training opportunities such as this one. The house rules for this webinar are as follows. The training session is divided into two parts and will be five, there will be a five minute intermission halfway through the presentation. You may keep your videos on during the presentation and the administrator will have all participants muted. During the presentation, you may ask questions by raise of hand located at the bottom of the screen. The administrator will then inform me when this happens and I will answer your question at that point in time. Another way in which to ask questions is by using the question and answer chat box or the, which appears on the right side of your screen when you select the icon. You can also ask questions via email on michelle.shaw at pscutt.com as appears on the contact slide at the end. At the end of the presentation, you will have a few survey questions to answer, which will come up after the webinar in a brief questionnaire survey on, on which you would be allowed to give your thoughts about the training. I encourage all of you to take full advantage of this online training material, which is being made available to you and which will be of practical use to you in the future. The sessions are all being recorded and will be posted on the PSCU website in due course. All participants will be receiving certificates at the end via email. Once again, I welcome you all and I look forward to seeing you again many more sessions to come and I wish, a very, wish you a very fruitful learning journey. I thank you. I will now share this slide. Right, so today we'll be looking at root crop cultivation. There are eight types of root crops which I'll be discussing today. That will be cassava, arrows, yam, sweet potato, dasheen, ginger, tanya, and Irish potato. Yes, you heard correctly, Irish potato that has recently begun trials in Trinidad and um, we, we will soon be doing it on a larger scale. So let us start with cassava. Um, the, the, the transplanting of cassava is done in, in, um, in this where, where you use um, eight, nine, eight, three feet apart and it's at the 45 degree angles using two to three nodes above the ground. Edos, we use um, cormels for planting edos at two feet apart. 
yam sets. We used pieces of yam heads and we planted three feet apart on mounds. Sweet potato I planted using slips or those are um, stem cuttings and they are planted one foot apart. Dasheen is planted by combs, planted one to two feet apart. And for, for the leaves, that is if you're growing the dasheen for the leaves. But however, if you're growing it for the, the um, comb or the, or the um, root part, it is planted three feet apart. Ginger is planted two feet apart. Tanya is planted three feet apart. Okay, well, we have the various types of root crops and the difference between the, the types depends on the, the, the root, the shape of the root. So we have tubers um, from the yam and the potato, and that tuber is, where, is the, the edible part of the plant on yam and potato. However, with cassava and sweet potato, the storage root is the edible part of the plant. So as you see in the diagrams, these storage roots are, are these areas that um, you, you is the edible part in cassava and sweet potato and yam, it would be the tubers. For cassava, that it, it is um, a root crop that belongs to the family um, Euphorbiaceae, and it's, it is one of the popular root crops consumed in the Caribbean. The tubers contain protein, fat, carbohydrate, calcium, phosphorus, iron, and vitamins B and C, as well as starch. Leaves are a good source of vitamins A, B, and C, calcium, and iron. Cassava leaves also contain 8 to 10% protein. Cassava is good for the digestive health, and the tuber contains insoluble fiber, which is not soluble in water. Fibers of this type serve to facilitate bowel movement and are able to absorb and remove toxins from the intestine. So we see the plant, the cassava plant, and it's a very hardy tree. It grows to, to very tall heights. And you see the two many types. There are sweet types and bitter types. So the sweet types, um, it, it is confined, main, the HCN, which is the hydrodynamic acid content, is confined mainly to the outer skin layers of the tuber. And once it is peeled, the cassava is safe for consumption. But the bitter types, the hydrodynamic acid is widely distributed in the outer skin layer and also in the edible flesh of the tuber. These types high in the hydrodynamic acid are used for animal feeds since the chipping and drying processes reduce the acid content to an acceptable level. All varieties grown in Trinidad and Tobago for the fresh market are sweet types and therefore it is safe for human consumption. There are more than 40 varieties of cassava and we, we have the maracas black, black stick white stick, butter stick, blue stick, MCOL22, CIAT hybrid, CMC40, and MX. The recommended variety for production at this time is the MX, and this variety is characterized by high yields, pest and disease tolerance, and good cooking quality. Cassava production. Cassava is grown mainly by small farmers and is consumed boiled and fried in soups and pastries. In Tobago, farine is made and it is a popular processed product. Consumption is not limited to the home since many fast food outlets do have cassava on their menu on a daily basis. Cassava soil requirements. Cassava can be grown on most soils. However, best soils are sandy clay loams that are well drained without fluctuating water table. Proper soil management practices, adequate soil drainage and limestone applications at two to three tons per hectare incorporated into the soil three to four months before planting are necessary for successful cultivation of cassava. The following sugarcane soils are the most recommended. 
We have Washington series, Waterloo series, Coover series, Freeport series, McBean series, Kunupia clay and Princess Town clay. These soils are mostly acidic, high in nitrogen with high al aluminum levels that stunt the plant growth and reduce formation of tuberous roots. Cassava land preparation. Cassava can be grown on many soil types, but a sandy clay loam or sandy loam will encourage better tuber shape and size. Avoid planting in flood prone areas. The crop has high demand for potash, excessively fertile soils will however result in high stem and leaf production with little or no tuber formation. Cassava crop grows well at pH 4.5 to 6.5. A soil test is recommended to determine the soil pH and the amount of limestone and fertilizer needed for optimum crop growth. Cassava land preparation steps. Firstly, you clear the land of all grass, brush and trees. Next, you plow, rotivate and ridge. Then you apply limestone at two to four tons per hectare before rotivating. Form ridges one meter apart and 25 centimeters high. Plow along the contour in hilly areas and ensure proper drains are formed. So we see this um, photo showing you the, the way um, some of these cassava plants are, are planted. And they are planted in stands, you call it stands. Land preparation in, in the procedure for land preparation. As I stated before, you clear the land and you and you broadcast limestone in the soil. You see the, the ridges and furrows. The ridges are the, the mounds. And these are two to three feet high, these ridges. And they, they are up, uh, at two to three feet apart. You apply pre-emergent weedicide to the soil according to the recommended recommendations on the manufacturer. Note that the manure is needed since manure is high in nitrogen. High nitrogen encourages the plant to produce, to, to produce leaves and little or no tubers. So you have to not do, try avoid putting too much um, nitrogen. So you don't use the manure in this case because that will um, cause the soil to get high nitrogen content. Cassava rainfall conditions. Cassava thrives best when rainfall is well distributed through the growing period. The cultivars such as MX, CIAT hybrid and CMC40 cannot withstand flooding or prolonged waterlog conditions. The tubers deteriorate rapidly under these conditions and are not marketable. So we have this photo of the cassava plant grown in field. And remember, these can also be grown at home in your yard as well as in containers. Cassava shade and temperature conditions. Cassava crop is highly sensitive to shade leading to low yields and must be grown under full sunlight. However, cassava can be successfully used as a shade plant in young cocoa plantations. Temperature, maximum root production occurs with a temperature range of between 25 to 32 degrees Celsius. Higher temperatures, slow photosynthesis and food produced by the leaves are used for the vegetative growth and not the tuber growth. So, the, the higher the temperature, the, the slower the rate of photosynthesis. Cassava planting material. The, it is propagated by stem cuttings as shown in the photo on the right. And these are called sticks. Silex sticks from plants that are eight to 15 months old, semi-hard and free from pest and disease. Younger planting material tends to be too soft and susceptible to drying. The older ones do not have sufficient food reserves necessary for development of roots and shoots. The, the middle stick in, the, in this photo is the, appropriate, is the most appropriate 
So the, we don't use the young ones on the left here, or we don't use it when it's too old. So we use the, the sticks that are in the middle where you have most food reserves. The lab cuttings from the middle stem portions, which is 30 centimeters along, uh, uh, 30 centimeters long with an average of nine to 12 nodes. Cut sets using a handsaw and or a clean sharp cutlass sterilized in 1% sodium hypochlorite. To cut, which is used to cut the top of the sticks and the lower end at an angle. Bundle the sets and soak the prepared sticks by dipping in a fungicide or insecticide solution for 10 to 15 minutes before planting. Allow the solution to drain off before, before planting. Note, always use protective gear when handling agricultural chemicals. Cassava planting procedure. You plant sets 30, 50 centimeters to 90 centimeters on ridges at 45 degree angle with two to three nodes above the soil. Cassava is normally planted in May or at the beginning of the rainy season. However, earlier plantings in March and April can significantly, significantly increase tuber yields. So now is a, an appropriate time for planting cassava. So, and the yields will be very um, enormous. Cassava weed management, use contact or pre-emergent herbicide to control weeds for the first three months of the growth. Hand weeding using holes are normally recommended after three months. If necessary, since the, the enlarged crop canopy should limit weed growth after three months. So this, this crop here is not in a, a suitable condition because there are too many weeds are growing. So this is how a crop should not look. Fertilizing of cassava, when the soil tests are not done, a general rec recommendation for fertilizing cassava can be NPK of 12, 24, 12, applied at a rate of 336 kilograms per hectare at six weeks after planting, followed by 16, 8, 24 at 16 weeks after planting. Mixtures of single fertilizers such as calcium nitrate, muriate of potash and triple superphosphate at 114 kilograms per hectare rate or 25 kilograms per hectare of, of phos phosphorus and 240 kilograms per hectare of potassium also applied at six and 16 weeks after planting. Average quantities work out to be one handful of fertilizer per plant at each application. We, pla you, we place fertilizers 15 to 45 centimeters from the base of the stem and, and in the holes that are drilled. Drill holes should be 10 centimeters to 15 centimeters in depth and placement of the fertilizers in the drilled holes reduces fertilizer loss through runoff water. Fertilizing plants 16 weeks after planting enhances tuber bulking. This is just a, a schedule of how fertilizers are applied. We have the time um, where you have uh, two to three weeks after planting, 12 weeks after planting, and then 24 weeks after planting. And it, it gives you the, um, the actual amounts per plant of fertilizer. And it tells you exactly what types and the ratios of the NPK. Cassava pest and disease management. The major pests and diseases are thrips and mites, which can be controlled using miticide or and insecticide. Growth regulators. These, these pests are prevalent during period, dry periods and decrease as rainfall increases. Cassava shoot fly is a systemic insecticide that should be used only during heavy infestations. For cinch bugs, we use cr crotillaria, which is a, called crotillaria, can be used as a tr 
as a trap crop for this bug, as well as crop rotation practices which break the life cycle of the bug. Cassava bacterial blight, rust, and super elongation disease are also other, other diseases uh, that affect cassava. This is a photo here showing damage caused by thrips and mites. And these are some other photos showing you the types of pests in cassava. We have the cassava mites at the top here. Then thrips is shown in this photo. Cinch bugs are, are shown in this photo on the, the third one. And the fourth photo is the cassava hornworm. Thrips, mites, and the shoot fly pest control. These pests are very tiny and difficult to see with the naked eye. They suck the sap from the young leaves, causing them to become crinkled, distorted, and discolored. This results in low tuber yields, and these pests are more prevalent during the dry periods. However, the population decreases when rainfall increases. Cassava shoot fly, which is shown in the picture on the right. The, the larva of this pest feeds on the tips of the plant, causing damage. Only the apical tips are seen in affected plants. The reduction in the number of green leaves results in low tuber leaf yields. Management of thrips, mites, and cassava shoot flies is done by applying a systemic insecticide every two to three months or as required, depending on the level of damage. Practice good field sanitation and crop rotation where possible. The, the cinch bug pest control. The pest lives in the soil and attacks punct and punctures the young developing tubers, making them un unmarketable. The feeding action of the cinch bug causes black spots to appear on the flesh, but this is only seen when the tuber is peeled. For management, you drench the soil with a soil acting insecticide before planting the sticks. Practice good field sanitation and crop rotation where possible. Disease management of cassava, we, they are, diseases are not widely distributed, however, there have been cases of cassava bacterial blight. Cassava bacterial blight, which causes rapid wilting and death of the plant. We have water soaked spots, which are seen on the leaves and stems of the plant. The bacterium is spread using this diseased planting material or contaminated soil. For management of the disease, you choose disease-free planting material since there is no chemical control and practice good field sanitation and crop rotation where possible. Remove all affected plants and burn them. Other problems are vascular streaking and soft rot. Soft rot is another um, disease which causes damage to tubers. And it is, it is a bacteria and it is, it's, it affects the, the cassava. And the, this is a picture of the bacterial blight on the leaves. Harvesting of cassava, it matures when it is ready for harvesting. It is between eight to 12 months of age after planting. Cutting back the cassava stems of, at one feet, one foot from the soil level at two weeks before harvesting, and this would, should cause tubers to mature and increase yields by 10%. Hold the stem gently, shake and pull to uproot the tubers. In soils that are compacted, use a fork to break the ridges before removing tubers. Ensure the tube, tubers do not break while harvesting. Do not weed before harvesting. Excess soil should be removed from the harvested tubers and the tubers carefully packed in crates or bags for transport. Crates with harvested tubers must be stored in cool, a cool place. Bagged cassava tubers prior to sale can be covered with moist jute bags. This reduces vascular streaking. 
Tubers should be prepared and, and ready for the market within three to four hours of harvesting and failure to do so will result in greater post-harvest losses. Harvesting by hand. You soak the tubers in water, when, then wash in, under running water. A soft bristle brush will help remove the soil debris. Tubers can also be sanitized by immersing them in a solution made from household bleach mixed at a rate of two tablespoons of bleach per gallon of water. Soak for 10 minutes and allow to air dry. Stem cuttings or, or sticks must be selected at the harvesting stage for future planting. This is just a cost of production table of cassava. We have the basic activities, land preparation, planting, fertilizer, uh, application, pest and disease control, weed control, and harvesting. We have uh, an average cost of expenditure of 37,100 TT per hectare to, to cultivate cassava. It could reach up to uh, about 50 to 60,000 as well. It, with, with increasing prices, now the rates, the rates are a bit higher. So I would say be, between 50 to 60,000 to, to cultivate one hectare of cassava, right? Edo's varieties, we, let's look at Edo's now. There are two main varieties. We have black edos and white edos. We, we see in the picture on the right, a picture of the black type, and then we have the white type. In Trinidad, we mostly have the black edos where the petiole is dark purple to black with a uh, latex is less and the skin layer is firm. The Edo's production, it belongs to the fam Edo's belongs to the family Araceae, and the corns contain high amount of carbohydrates and a good source of fiber. The flesh of the Edo's contains calcium oxalate crystals, which is a chemical compound that forms envelope-shaped crystals known as in plants as raphids. The compound calcium oxalate crystal is suggested by some to be a major constituent in human kidney stones. So cooking nullifies the ray feeds, making it safe for human consumption. The land pre preparation for edos, they can be grown in many soil types, but sandy clay loam or sandy loam soil will encourage better comb shape and size and avoid planting in flood blown areas. This crop grows well at pH 5.5 to 6.5. A soil test is recommended to determine soil pH and the amount of limestone and fertilizer that is needed for optimum growth. So we have here a, a field of edos. You see the leaves shown here. And land preparation procedure, we have clear the area of all vegetation, then plow, broadcast limestone based on the soil test results. Then you rotivate and make ridges at two to three feet high and two to three feet apart. On hilly areas, ensure plowing is done along contours to minimize soil erosion. Apply pre-emergent weedicide to the soil according to the recommendations of, by the manufacturer before planting the crop. Note, no manure is needed since manure is high in nitrogen and encourages plant to produce too many leaves and little or no comels or tubers. However, manure, manure can be used to improve soil structure in areas where there are heavy clay soils. Addo selection of planting material. In the production of edos, both head, the head, which is the comb tuber, and the lateral suckers, which are the comel tubers called edo seed, can, can be used as planting material. However, the comels are mainly used as planting material and sold as the main commodity. 
Select material from healthy plants at the time of harvesting, which is six to eight months after planting. Remove soil and soak cormels in a fungicide and an insecticide solution for 10 to 15 minutes before planting. Note, always use protective gear when handling ag agricultural chemicals. So we see here, this is a picture here where you have the cormel and you, this is what is used for planting of edos. Planting edos, plant cormels at one to two feet apart on ridges and 45,000 cormels are required for a hectare of land. A dry period is required to assist in maturity of cormels and to prevent sprouting in the field. Therefore, this crop must be planted at a time to allow maturity stage of six to eight months to be during the dry season. The suggested time to plant may be at the beginning or middle of the rainy season. Irrigation and weed control. Water is needed to keep the soil moist throughout the life of a crop. Water, too much water and lack of proper drainage causes corms and cormels to rot. Weed control, weeds compete with the growing plants for moisture, nutrients and sunlight. They also have a pest and diseases. A weed-free field is preferred. See, this, this is a picture of a weed-free field and remember a pre-emergent herbicide should be applied to the soil before planting to suppress weed growth. Remove weeds manually with a cutlass or hoe or the contact herbicide using a shield to prevent chemical drift onto the growing crops. Molding of edos. Molding is a common practice in edos and we use a hoe to pull soil around the root area of the plant. This practice is usually done with a hoe then manual weed control when manual weed, weed control is taking place. Molding keeps the head of the main corm covered. Two moldings are re recommended in the life of the crop. The first molding at six to eight weeks after planting and secondly at the 14 to 16 week after planting. This coincides with second and third fertilizer application. Fertilizing of adults, fertilizers provide additional nutrients which encourage plants to produce higher yields. Use the results of soil tests to determine the type and amount of fertilizer to be used for the crop. Place the fertilizer between the plants along the ridge. If the soil test is not performed, three fertilizer applications are recommended. The first at one to two weeks after planting, the second fertilizer application at eight to 10 weeks after planting and the third fertilizer application at 16 to 18 weeks after planting. At eight to 10 weeks and 16 to 18 weeks after planting, place recommended fertilizers two to three inches away from the plant to prevent burning. Excessive nitrogen fertilizers can increase vegetative growth such as leaves and the petiole of the plant, but would lead to little growth of the corm and cormel. The fertilizing schedule, again, we, look, we have it at various times, at the three times mentioned earlier, and we have the, the exact amounts and portions of fertilizer to be applied per hectare. And then we have the types in the particular ratios of uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So we have the detailed um, proportions of the fertilizer to go with the different times of application. Pest and weed management. Some pests of, of edos include aphids, white flies, and mites. These pests, however, are generally not considered pests of economic importance, therefore no control measures are recommended. White grub is, however, that, that the white grub, however, must be controlled. And this pest is the larval stage of the beetle, which lives in the soil and feeds on the developing combs and cormels. 
making them unmarketable. We must control the weeds in and around the field, and this is recommended to promote wind circulation between plants and reduce humidity in the field. We use a soil acting insecticide as a soil drench at two, eight, and 14 weeks after planting. Always follow, follow the manufacturer's recommendation on the label when using chemicals. Use the application rates and be guided by pre-harvest intervals. Disease management in adults. The taro leaf blight caused by Phytophthora is the main disease that affects arrows. This disease is caused by a fungus and appears as purplish to brownish water-soaked circular lesions on the leaves. Over time, lesions enlarge and the entire lamina of the leaf dies. So we see a photo of the lamina of the leaf being affected by Phytophthora. Phytophthora. Free water, which collects on the older leaves, encourages fungal growth and fungal spores to germinate. Disease management and control with humidity, high humidity encourages fungus to multiply. Control weeds in and around the field. This is recommended to promote wind circulation. Remove leaves that are heavily infested with the symptoms of disease, collect them and burn away from the field. Apply a fungicide to leaves in heavily infested field after removing infected leaves. Always read the fungicide label and follow manufacturer's instructions. Harvesting adults. Adults mature and are ready for harvesting between six to eight months after planting. At this time, leaves and petioles of plant change from green to yellow and then, then brown and fall over. Use a fork to break the banks and remove the corms and cormels. Remove excess soil from the harvested corms and pack in plastic harvesting crates for transport. Crates with corms must be kept in a cool shaded area to reduce heat buildup in the commodity. And we have estimated yields of say 22,000 to 28,000 kilograms per hectare. Poor service handling. We have adult corms can be attacked by secondary organisms while in storage. Therefore, fungicide dip is recommended. This forms a protective layer around adults. Select corms which are not damaged and free from pest and disease. Clean corms removing all dry matter and soil attached. Wash corms in clean water. Dip the prepared corms in fungicide solution and allow to air dry in well ventilated shaded areas. So these are the clean, uh, um, well-prepared um, adults that are um, ready for marketing. Cost of production. When preparing the cost of production for the crop, crop consideration must be given to all activities involved in growing the crop and the cost of the inputs. Some of these activities include land preparation, planting and fertilizing, Labor costs for weed control, pest management, and harvesting must also be considered. The following table will give you the, the cost of production. Again, we have the activities, the basic activities, land preparation, planting, fertilizer application, pest and disease control, weed control, harvesting. And these basic activities, we have various rates, and quantities of, of the material, say planting material or fertilizer um, quantities. And we have a total of say 35,000 per hectare TT in TT dollars. So we have an average costing for Edo's production. Yam, yam is, uh, we have three varieties in Trinidad. The, 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 we have the Ghanaian yam varieties, which recently harvested, which, which were recently um, um, received at the National Seed Bank in Shagaramas in Trinidad. And we have good prospects, particularly 
in, in the terms of the yield storability shape, and they have re remarkable potential for agro-processing. So in Trinidad, we have three varieties of the Ghanaian yam. This diagram, this photo shows you a picture of the, the yam that we they have presently at the National Seed Bank. Yam cultivation, we have planting and transplanting and watering. First, once you have chosen your planting material, you have several methods of planting and transplanting. The methods used are direct seeding or transplanting seedlings, transplanting cuttings, transplanting suckers, or transplanting the fruit trees. So there are various methods of transplanting for yam cultivation. Direct seeding of the yam. The advantages are they are planted directly because of the large seed, so it has enough food reserve for the young plant to establish itself. The disadvantages of direct seeding of yam, they require three to four times more seeds, they, they need more weed control is necessary, and more time and effort in pest and disease control is required. This is um, seed yam plants grown in a field, and they, they, they are used, trellises are used to, to um, keep it, hold it in an upright position. So they are staked, they use, the um, yam plants are being staked in this picture. Transplanting of seedlings now. Ensure seedlings are hardened off. Plant seedlings in the late afternoon and prepare the land or the containers for the plants. Place stakes or supports for the plants and prepare the planting hole de depending on the seedling size. The hole should be twice as large as the root ball. Incorporate soil from the hole with manure. This is a picture where you have some yam crops being um, staked in a pyra pyramid type of stake. The steps in transplanting the seedlings, remove seedlings from the seedling tray and loosen the medium around the root. Next, you make a hole large enough for the root to be comfortable fit in the planting hole. Then you set the plant in the soil, keeping it level to the soil. Do not bury the seedling too deep. Do not pile the soil around the seedling stem. Lightly compress the soil around the seedling once planted. Water the seedling as soon as it is transplanted and provide a plant with a liquid fertilizer as a soil drench. In this photo, we have yam that is intercropped with, well, corn. We, we, we can intercrop yam with corn. And this is, these are the steps for transplanting. The pest and disease now, we, Symptoms of viruses that can be present on leaves of the entire plant include mosaic vein banding, mottling, leaf distortion, with, and stunting. So we see this, this photo of diseases in the plants. Treating sets before planting helps to control pests and disease. Land preparation should be done in such a way that rain or irrigation water does not collect at points in the field. Such points of collection tend to harbor higher concentrations of nematodes if they are present. Many yam pests such as nematodes, mealybugs, scale insects, and crickets are carried from the field into the market stalls where they continue to cause damage in stored tubers and then are returned to the field at planting if they are not well managed. The, the last picture here shows you um, the mealybug generally, which is ash colored and covered with whitish cotton wool, wool like material on the surface of the, the edus of the yam. So these white areas are where the mealybug has attacked the yam. Importance of water for plants, solvent for materials. It is a solvent for minerals. Then it transport of minerals and manufactured food. 
water be, is needed for evaporation or cooling, and the plant structure and turgidity, and, and it, it helps the plant to be more turgid. It also is important for photosynthesis of the plant, which is the manufacture of food in the leaves of the plant. So this is how water, water is used in irrigating these crops here through furrows. Okay, well, we have completed uh, three of the root crops and we will now go for a five minute break where we, and until we will continue the others in the second half of the, um, of this, Web, um, agriculture training program. So let us just take five minutes now and we'll come back and finish the other half where we have the remaining root crops. We have five, uh, five more which we would like to, to do. And so we, we, we will be back shortly. Okay, thank you.
Okay, welcome back. Let me back to the training and we will now continue. Before I do continue, I there was a question from Mr. McLeod, I think. Yes, um, he has asked if the butter stick planting material is available and if how and where it could be sourced. Well, as I mentioned earlier, the the planting material for these um, varieties are obtained at the National Seed Bank in Shakaramas. So that is where these um, varieties are sourced, okay? Hi, Michelle, we also have a question from Meline Alexander. Okay, um, I, I'm not hearing very clearly. I don't know if you could speak a little louder. Sorry, we have a question okay, from Meline Alexander. Okay, yes. Um, can I get the question? Yes, good afternoon, Miss 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 Alexander. You need to unmute your mic, can um, and I'll be able to hear your question. Right, thank you. Sorry, that was a, a mistake there. I don't know what happened. Yes, I'm hearing you. No, I don't have a question. Sorry. Okay, no problem, and thanks then. All right, let's let's move move on. So we start the second half with um stop we talking about sweet potato. Sweet potato, the recommended variety of sweet potato in Trinidad is the chicken foot. This is because it produces good yields, can withstand environmental conditions, and is tolerant to the major pests of sweet potato. The leaves of the plant are shaped like a chicken foot, and the skin of the tuber is purple to pink and the flesh color is cream to yellow. So the, the leaf shape is what is what has given it that name. The chicken foot variety, there are approximately 55 varieties in Trinidad and Tobago. The varieties vary in shape, size, and color. And the most popular variety in Trinidad, chicken foot, produces relatively good yields and it can withstand environmental conditions. And it is most accepted by consumers. We see the diagram here of what the um, sweet potato looks like. Characteristics of sweet potato. The roots arise from the stem nodes of the sweet potato plant. There are three types of roots, thick roots, thin roots, and tuberous roots. And the thick roots are for absorption and anchorage. The thin roots are for absorption of, of water and the tuberous roots, which develop into the sweet potato tubers. Tubers vary in size and shape depending on the variety and soil type. The surface of the skin or the skin color ranges from white, yellow, red, purple, or brown. The flesh of the, of the sweet potato is yellow, orange, red, or purple, depending on the variety. So this is the sweet potato grown in the field here. The sweet potato cultivation. Sweet potato tuber is used as a staple and is an excellent source of beta, beta carotene, vitamins, iron, calcium, magnesium, manganese, and potassium, which are essential for good health and it is also a great source of dietary fiber, especially when eaten with the peel. The peel and flesh color of tubers vary depending on variety. Land preparation. Sweet potato must be grown in full sunlight for maximum yields. Moderately deep, fine sandy loam soil with adequate drainage is recommended for production of good quality tubers. Avoid planting in areas prone to flooding since excess soil moisture can promote tuber rot. Soil pH of 5.6 to 6.5, and a soil test is recommended to determine pH of soil and the amount of limestone and fertilizer needed. So we have the ridges of which are 
at least two to three feet high, one, one to two feet high, the ridges, and then the, the distance apart of the ridges are two to three feet apart. So the diagram shows you here, the one to two feet high and two to three feet apart. Cultural practices, you clear the land for of all vegetation, deep plow, then broadcast limestone based on soil test results. Rotivate and make ridges or banks. Ridges must be formed one to two feet high and two to three feet apart. Apply pre-emergent weedicide to soil according to rec manufacturer's recommendation. No manure is needed uh, again. Planting material selection for the sweet potato. Sweet potatoes are propagated from slips or stem cuttings, which can be obtained from previous crops. Small tubers can be used to produce nursery plants, from which slips are also cut. Select slips from plants two to three months old. Use the tips of the plants since they are healthy, vigorous, vigorous growing and free from pests and disease. So we, we, when you have these um, plants growing from the sweet potato, you, you cut the, uh, the top part at, at when the plant, plant is two to three months old. So the top part of the, the stems is where you cut the slips. Preparation of sweet potato. Cut slips 30 centimeters or one foot long. Soak the slips in systemic insecticide solution for 15 minutes just before planting to destroy any pests which might be present in or on the pieces of planting material. Always use protective gear when handling agricultural chemicals. So this photo shows you slips to be planted. Preparing planting material. But Sweet potatoes are propagated from small tubers or the seed or slips, which are the stem or vine cuttings. Selecting slips from the plants which are healthy is important and vigorous and with plants which are vigorous and free from pest and disease. We cut the slips again at one foot long and use only the tip since it is the most actively growing plant part of the plant. Soak the entire slip in systemic insecticide for 15 to 20 minutes before planting. And these are some plants at five weeks after transplanting. So it grows in this manner on the, on the ridges. Sweet potato slips, plant each prepared slip at six inches deep so that as many nodes are possible and are covered by the soil. The slips are planted one foot apart on the ridge. And note for added protection, a soil insecticide is applied to the soil before planting the slips to control pests such as weevils and flea beetle larvae. So the, the slips are planted one foot apart on the ridge on the ridges itself. Planting slips of sweet potato, again the slips one foot one feet apart on the ridge or bank, then make an opening on this in the soil with short handled hoe or cutlass. Place the slip in the opening and cover three quarters of the length of the slip with soil, leaving the tip exposed. So these are the slips that are planted in this diagram. Soil requirements for sweet potato. To ensure optimal soil conditions, soils are tested for pH. Then the sweet potato is tolerant to pH of as low as 4.5. However, a pH of 5.6 to 6.5 is best for the plant growth. For best results, use two to four tons per hectare of limestone. Limestone brings the pH closer to seven pH, which is neutral and adds calcium to the soil. A healthy sweet potato plant in this diagram. 
irrigating sweet potato ensure uh, adequate moisture in soil by applying water immediately after planting. Fields should be irrigated often as possible. Watering is critical in the first five to six weeks after planting to encourage tuberous roots. Then after this period, the plant would better be able to withstand drier conditions. Soils will crust easily, which crust easily are low in oxygen and this results in poor tuber sets and low yields. Too much water lowers soil oxygen, thereby causing tubers to rot. Soil moisture fluctuations usually result in cracking of tubers. Note absence of rain, in the, in the absence of rain, irrigate the field once a week. Here we see the PVC pipe and the hoses for irrigating the field. And it, we must always have proper drainage to prevent um, rotting of the tubers. The physiological disorders in the sweet potato, we have this diagram shows you cracking of the tuber. Cracking is caused by inadequate growing conditions and especially uneven watering. Sores can also occur on the tuber. These occur in waterlogged soils where oxygen levels are low. Roots are very active when and when they are oxygen starved, the tissues break down causing stores, sores. Weed control, this is a field that is properly weeded. Control weeds since they compete with growing plants for moisture, nutrients, and sunlight. Weeds also harbor pests and disease. And remember, a pre-emergent herbicide should be applied to the soil before planting to suppress weed growth. Remove weeds manually or control with contact herbicides when necessary, using a shield until vines have covered the soil. Select herbicides. Selective herbicides can also be used during crop growth. Fertilizing of sweet potato. Fertilizers provide nutrients to the soil and encourages plants to produce higher yields. Place fertilizer between plants along the ridge. If possible, cover the fertilizer with soil. Two fertilizer applications are required throughout the life of the sweet potato crop. First, at the planting or within three weeks after planting and then at eight weeks after planting. So we have two, two occasions where fertilizer application is important, at three weeks and then at eight weeks after planting. This table gives you the exact amounts of fertilizer and at the particular times, at the three week plant, after three weeks after planting, we, we use this amount of fertilizer, which is about two to three ounces per plant. Then at eight weeks after planting, we use three to four ounces per plant. And the ratios of the NPK fertilizer are in these, these ratios. 12, 24, 12 for the three week um, after planting and 16, 8, 24 at the eight weeks after planting. Commercial fertilizing of sweet potato on a larger scale, if you wish to go plant on a larger scale, we use simple fertilizer. Only one nutrient is provided. Um, that is urea triple superphosphate. Complete fertilizer, many nutrients, nutrients are provided, such as NPK fertilizers. And ideally, a soil test is the best guide for determining the type and amount of fertilizer. Sweet potato needs moderate amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus, but significant amounts of potassium. So the K must al always be a, a, high, a high value. Low potassium reduces yields and increases number of long slender mal malformed roots. So always try to have 
high amounts of potassium in the NPK ratio. In the absence of a soil test, the table on the right gives the recommended fertilizer schedule. And we have at the three week after planting of two ounce per plant of fertilizer of the NPK ratio as given. And at the five week after planting, we use the three ounce per plant in the 16A24 ratio. Pest management of sweet potato. The major pests are sweet potato weevil. Then we have sweet potato stem borer. Sweet potato weevil as shown in this diagram, the damage, damages that are caused by the weevil. Um, we have the adult female makes holes at the base of the stem or the, in the tuber near the soil surface in which they lay eggs. The eggs hatch into larvae or worms, which tunnel downwards and feed just below the peel layer of the tuber, causing damage. The sweet potato stem borer, as the damage caused as shown in this picture, the stem borer, the adult moth lays eggs on the leaves and stems of the plant. The eggs hatch into larvae or worms and they burrow into the stems. They continue to feed eventually reaching inside the tuber where they tunnel causing extensive damage. So in this case, they, they, in, they are instigated in the leaves and the stems of the plant, the, the potato stem borer. Pest management for sweet potato. First, you soak the prepared slips in systemic insecticide solution for 15 minutes before planting. Apply systemic insecticide according to manufacturer's recommendations to the plant during growth. So this is some damage caused by pest, pest as, this, as mentioned in the previous slide. Disease management. We have black rot disease, which is a fungal disease caused by um, various uh, the scientific name, ceratocystis, which can affect the plant and tuber at any stage of growth and development. The disease symptoms on the plant include stunting, wilting, yellowing, leaf drop, and plant death. Large circular brownish to black firm dry rots are seen on the sweet potatoes, mainly when placed in storage. So we see the, the dark areas on the sweet potato are the, the black rot disease. Soft rot is a fungal disease caused by rhizopus, which is common post-harvest problem. The infection usually occurs before and during harvest through injuries on the surface of the sweet potato. The tissue rapidly becomes soft, str stringy and watery with a fermented surface. Disease management of the black rot and soft rot. These diseases can be managed by preparing the land as recommended and maintaining proper drainage throughout the life of the crop. Avoid growing sweet potatoes in waterlogged soils and do not damage tubers while harvesting. So this is the soft rot seen on the potato and it's caused by pathogens. We have a table showing the disease management practices, and we have signs and symptoms, which I discussed earlier about the black rot and the signs and symptoms of the soft rot. The control practices, as I said, basically is avoiding planting in waterlogged areas, good field sanitation, and prop, good crop rotation, which prevents buildup of disease in the field. Harvesting sweet potato. Most sweet potato varieties are ready for harvesting four to five months after planting. The size of tubers normally indicates maturity. Maturity is assessed by randomly cutting the tuber and observing the latex. The latex oozing from the immature tubers quickly turns black. The latex in mature tubers is creamy white and takes a longer period of time to turn black. So that is the, the test for determining the maturity in the sweet potato. Delaying harvesting while increase, will increase risk of pest attack. 
And once the crop is managed properly, each hectare can yield approximately 11,000 kilograms per hectare or 15,000 pounds per acre. So we, this is someone harvesting the sweet potato. Harvesting methods, we have both two types, manual and mechanical. We see the top one where manual methods are used where the root area is loosened using a fork and taking care not to damage tubers. In the mechanical method, the vines are removed using a cutlass, then a modified banker, which is a, a, an equipment, a harvesting equipment is used to uproot the tubers. So we have two basic types of harvesting shown there. Do not wash the tubers when it's harvested since the moisture can reduce the shelf life of the tuber. Use a soft dry cloth to remove the soil from the tuber. Good quality potatoes would, should have uniform shape and size and should be smooth and firm. Harvested tubers must not remain in the field in heaps where they can be scorched by the sun. storage of the sweet potato. They are stored in these plastic crates. And when they are harvested, they are cleaned of all soil, soak the tubers for 10 minutes in clean water containing household bleach at a rate of one teaspoon per liter, dip the washed tuber in fungicide solution and place in a cool shaded area to air dry. Place dry tubers in plastic crates as shown on the right for storage and transport. Do not use boxes or bags to store and transport sweet potatoes as they cause injury, which reduces quality and shelf life of the tuber. Cost of production. When preparing the cost of production of sweet, sweet potato, consideration is given to all activities involved in growing this, the crop. These activities are land preparation, planting, fertilizing, labor costs for weed control, pest management, and harvesting. So this is the field where we have a, a healthy crop of sweet potato. And this is a container which can, be, can grow sweet potatoes at home or in grow boxes. This is a table of the cost of production. And per, per hectare, we can get a total of say 42,000 TT per hectare. And out of all the root crops, sweet potato usually has a higher cost of production. Sweet potato has the highest cost and higher than the cassava and the adults. Also it's, it's higher than dashim. The health benefits of sweet potato. It is rich in vitamin A, vitamin C, and B6. Both vitamins A and C are powerful antioxidants that work in the body to remove free radicals and can damage healthy cells. Beta carotene is converted in the intestine into vitamin A, which is essential for normal vision as well as proper bone growth, healthy skin, protection of mucous membranes in the digestive, respiratory and urinary tracts against infection. Darker varieties of sweet potato have higher concentration of beta, beta carotene. Pest management in sweet potato. The pests are West Indian sweet potato weevil and the sweet potato borer. So the signs for the West Indian sweet potato weevil are brown tunnels seen in when the stems or tubers are cut and for the sweet potato borer, larvae are cream to light purple in color and the large brown tunnels can be seen when tubers are cut. This is the control management. Usually the, the slips from healthy plants, you, you, you should use slips from healthy plants. And Firstly, we can soak the entire slip in insecticidal solution for 20 minutes before planting. 
apply systemic insecticide one month after planting and a second application two months later. Practice good field sanitation by removing weeds and diseased plants from the field. Practice crop rotation to prevent buildup of pests in the field and monitor and observe crop regularly. So these are the basic control practices. The three pests shown here, we have Western and Weevil damage on the, on the tuber. Then we have the borer damage in the tuber causing these brown areas. And the pupal stage of the borer in the tuber, we see one of the larvae or the pupa, the pupa that is after the larval stage, the pupa is seen inside of the tuber. Post-harvest handling of sweet potato. Most sweet potatoes are left in shaded areas to dry. Do not use feed bags for transporting the tuber as they cause abrasions. Harvested tubers must be transported using the plastic crates shown in the photo and it facilitates good air circulation. Once harvested, they should be cleaned and dried and then they are ready for sale. We now speak about dashin. Dashin is the, in the islands of the Eastern Caribbean, the, the dashin is suited for, for cultivation. They, they are more than, um, when there are more than 70 inches of rainfall per year, that is, those are the areas where um, dashin cultivation is recommended. Once there are more than 70 inches of rainfall per year, this is a dashing plant as seen in the photo, and we this is a sprouted dashing mini, mini set. And this is how it is grown from a mini set. Selection and preparation of dashing. Farmers buy or obtain planting material, with, like, uh, which are the suckers from their own fields after harvest. Suckers, which are the lateral sprouts lateral shoots from the main comb are selected from most vigorous growing plants. Suckers are cleaned of all roots, dead tissue and soil and are prepared for planting with the following specifications. The upper two centimeters of the comb intact with a basal diameter of five to seven centimeters weighing about 250 grams and and the petiole cut to a length of 25 to 30 centimeters. To prevent rotting, the prepared planting material is dipped in a solution containing 90 milliliters of bleach in 4.5 liters of water for 15 to 20 minutes. 200 liters drum cut in half can be used for the dipping. So we see a in the photo, treating the dashin combs for planting. So in the field, we have the, the, the solution with the bleach being used to treat the combs and, and they are also planted in the field. The treatment, planting material selection and treatment. The suckers should be harvested from only the most vigorous plants, cleaned of, of all roots and mildly disinfected in a mixture of one gallon and six tablespoons or 90 milliliters bleach. So this is the same mixture that I, for the treatment. And I again, it is six tablespoons of bleach to one gallon of water. Selecting the combs for planting in this photo. These are what the combs uh, uh, look like and they, they are selected for planting and treated. Planting dashing, space the planting holes two feet apart in rows. Avoid continuous cropping of the same field for, with dashing so as to prevent buildup of pests and disease. Fork the land to a depth of 10, of 10 to 20 inches, which allow dashing to be planted at favorable depths of four to seven inches. 
and no ridging is necessary since dashin thrives under mo moist conditions. So we don't need to plant in any ridges. They are, they are just planted on the flat surface of the soil as moist conditions are, are best suited for dashin. We have this two types here, the pink dashin and the white dashin. In Trinidad, we mostly see the pink dashin, which can grow. We have we see them growing in drains and so on. And this is a very common type in Trinidad, the pink dashin. By the stems, the color of the stems we see here. The white dashin is shown in this picture. We don't see this type very much in Trinidad. The striation of the dashin, the, the root part. Striation of the corky fibrous strings, which is the hardening of the xylem vessels, appear in the dashin combs when there is not enough water supplied to develop the combs. To reduce striations, plant in wet areas and avoid planting the crop in dry areas if irrigation is not provided. Also plant dashin in holes rather than on ridges as the holes retain soil moisture. Fertilizing dashin. After limestone application, leave the land to weather for a few weeks. Compound NPK fertilizer gives good dashin yields. The suggested rate of application is one ounce per plant at one to two weeks after planting and again at two to three months. The fertilizer is best applied in a band running along the row about five to 12 inches away from the base of the plant. Work the fertilizer into the soil with a hoe and fertilizers left on the surface will be washed away by heavy rains. So you must work the fertilizer into the soil. So when you, when you have you prepare, prepare the land and you put plant the dashing, the, the, the best um, areas is where there are high water, where the water is, is very abundant. And these are the areas where dashin grows most um, appropriately, where there's a lot of water as seen there. Weed control, use pre-emergence herbicide, followed by post-planting application of a fusillade or gramoxone. Fusillade is useful where the weeds are predominantly true grasses, but gramoxone will kill both grass and the broadleaf weeds. Trinidad, we, we in Trinidad, we try to phase out the gramazone. I think we are still in that process of phasing out the, the, that pesticide. Fusillade sprayed over the top of the crop kills grasses in two to three weeks, and the dashing is not affected, but the broadleaf weeds then have to be hand weeded. Gramazone will kill all weeds and the crop also. Therefore, it must be applied with a spray shield to prevent drift onto the dashing leaves. These are the field here with the dashing leaves. Pest and disease control. The crop rotation program helps keep down pest and disease. Sporadic attacks of slugs and snails should be dealt with immediately with use of slug baits. The most prevalent insect pests are white flies and aphids, and these are sometimes accompanied by moles on leaves. The most prevalent insect pests, as again, they, they, they form on the, 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 um, the dashim plant and the leaves begin to develop moles. These are controlled by insecticidal sprays. The leaves mold and the leaf spots can be controlled by copper-based fungicides. Only apply insecticides or fungicides when the damage to the dashing leaves is over 10 to 15%. We see the dashing soft rot disease on, on these um, tubers here. This is the, the tuber that is cut into sections and the soft rot disease is seen inside of the fleshy part of the tuber. Harvesting dashing. Dashing varieties will mature at seven to eight months and sample a few plants to make sure that the harvest is ready. Forks are used to dip out the combs, but extreme care must be taken to avoid damage to combs. But extreme and extreme care 
is taken to, to prevent this damage. Cut the bruised and battered combs that rot faster during the one to three week weeks to, for export. So the bruised and battered combs, which rot faster during the one to three weeks trip for export must be cut. Sound combs will keep up to four weeks if a fungicide dip is done immediately after harvest. Use rigid containers like the plastic crates as shown in the picture and baskets to move the dashing combs. So these are the crates as shown here. The fungal dip treatment for the dashing, wash the dashing combs in clean running water to remove all soil roots and dead tissues, rubbing with rough rag or medium hard scrubbing brush, that, which will help. Discard the rotted combs, abnormally shaped combs, less than two pounds in weight. Cut off the tail end of the comb to leave about quarter to half inch on the comb and cut the top to leave one inch long stalk. Attach to the dashing comb. Dip the combs for two to three seconds in a solution of six gallons water to half of Rydomel, which is a, a, a solution for, for, for um, cleaning the, the dashing. Mix well in wooden, with a wooden stick using use a dip in, until the level drops too low or the mixture becomes discolored, whichever comes first. After dipping, place combs in 30 to 40 pound containers with, for shipment. And if the, cart, the cartons, boxes or crates are used, they can be lined with plastic to retain moisture released from the combs without any effects. Pack in, in um, packing coconut fibers that is used to keep dashing combs moist and fresh. So coconut fiber can be used to keep the, the keep it fresh from the um, drying or desiccation. Let's talk about ginger production. Ginger belongs to this family and the plant grows in a height of to a height of about two to four feet. Ginger is a rhizome and it means that it has underground stems which often sends, sends out roots and shoots from its nodes. So this is a picture of the ginger plant and as it's a rhizome, it sends out roots and shoots. This crop is grown for its high, it's sweet, pungent and aromatic and is used as spice in culinary preparations as a flavoring agent and in beverages in a number of traditional medicines. The ginger is com commercially available in three forms, fresh rhizome processed, it could be dried, ground or candied and in pure, for pure oils. The fresh produce obtains high price in the local market compared to other underground type crops. In the dried form, it could be in, in the powder form, which is sold in supermarkets and so on. Soil requirements for ginger. Ginger can be grown on many soil types, but a, a sandy clay loam or sandy loam soil will encourage better shape and size. Avoid planting in flood prone areas. This crop grows well at pH 5.6 to 6.5. A soil test is recommended to determine soil pH and the amount of limestone and fertilizer needed for optimum growth. The crop has high demand for potash and must be grown in full sunlight for maximum yields. Land preparation of ginger. Clear the area of all vegetation, deep plow, add limestone based in the soil based uh, limestone based on soil test results, add cured well rotted manure to improve soil structure and fertility, rotovate and make ridges two to three feet high and two to three feet apart as shown in this diagram. 
So we have ridges and we have, have them two to three feet apart. And they could be grown on slopes and by plowing along contours to minimize soil erosion. Apply pre-emergent weedicide to the soil according to manufacturer's recommendation before planting crops. Ginger variety selection. Ginger variety names are given based on location or regions in which they are grown. However, in Trinidad and Tobago, the most popular varieties are large yellow referred to as Chinese ginger, which has a low to medium pungency level and is high in high demand by consumers. So this is, this is the, the Chinese ginger shown here, which is large yellow, and it has a, a high yellow color in the inside. The small yellow referred to as Jap Japanese ginger, which has high pungency, sharp scent level, but is low in demand. Large and small ginger, as this, they are distinguished mainly based on the thickness of the rhizome and the level of pungency. So this is the ginger plant shown in the photo. And this is the color of the inside, a bright yellow. And the Chinese ginger is the most popular one grown in Trinidad. Preparation of ginger planting material. Ginger is propagated asexually using pieces of rhizomes called sets, as shown in this diagram. This set is about two inches in length, and it's taken from the tip of this larger ginger. The flowers of the plants are usually sterile and rarely set seeds. Select planting material which are healthy, free from signs of pest and disease, mature, firm, and not dried and shriveled. Soak the rhizomes in clean water for 10 to 12 hours to stimulate sprouting. Cut rhizomes into, five, into two inch sets as shown in the diagram. Sets with a few growing buds. Soak sets in a copper-based fungicide and insecticide or nematicide solution for 10 minutes. Drain and then plant. Yields are not affected by set size. So from a sprouted ginger set, we, 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 have, we have to cut them in two inch lengths to be planted. Planting of the sets. Plant sets one foot apart within rows and at a depth of 1.2 to 2 inches with the growing buds facing up. Within three to six weeks after planting, the shoot can be seen above the ground, provided that the soil is moist. Approximately 50,000 plants are required for one hectare and approximately eight 1,800 pounds per acre or 800 kilograms per hectare of planting material is needed for propagation. Irrigating of ginger. Water is needed to keep the soil moist throughout life of the crop. However, too much water and lack of proper drainage cause rhizomes to rot. Soil moisture is critical at the time of planting to prevent the sprouts on the sets from drying, from dying, and the planting material from drying out. So this is a field of ginger as shown here, and it is it has proper drainage with the surface irrigation furrow system. So there are rows of fur furrows. Mulching of ginger. Mulching should be practiced to conserve moisture in the soil around the plant and also to keep weed growth down. Mulching is done by placing dry grass or leaves around the growing plant. So each, each plant in the field must be properly, properly mulched to pre prevent loss of, of moisture around the base of the plant. Weed control now. Weeds compete with the growing plants for moisture, nutrients, and sunlight, and they also harbor plant pests and disease. Remember, pre-emergent weedicide should be applied to the soil before planting to suppress weed growth. Remove weeds manually using cutlass or hoe 
or control with contact weedicides using a shield to prevent chemical drift onto the growing crop. So again, this is a field with the ginger. Fertilizing ginger, the ginger plant requires all elements for optimum growth and production. These elements are usually provided by growing medium. The elements, oxygen and carbon dioxide are taken up from the atmosphere and commercial fertilizers are used to enhance the nutrient levels in the soil. It is important to understand the types of fertilizers and amounts for each plant at the different stages of development. Use the results of the soil test to determine the type and amount of fertilizer to be used for the growing of the crop. If the soil test is not performed, for four fertilizer applications are recommended. So we see the ginger grown in the field here again. This is a schedule for the application of fertilizers and we see it being applied at different stages at two to three weeks after shoots emerge. That is after, after the planting stage. Then we have at eight to 10 weeks after shoots emerge and 16 to 18 weeks after shoots emerge. So these are four different times in which the fertilizers are applied. So at the planting stage, we, we mix, mix the fertilizer in the planting hole in, in the soil. So we use it in, in these proportions with the NPK ratio, different rates of NPK. And the fertilizer high nitrogen where N is 20 in the, the this in this two to three weeks after shoots emerge, we use um, high nitrogen amounts or calcium nitrate to encourage vegetative growth. So we try to encourage the vegetative growth in the second and third stages of application. And in the final stage of fertilizer application, we apply fertilizer high in potassium, where the potassium or K, which is the potash, is highest um, for the rhizome to bulk and gain weight. The only time where the phosphorus is a high amount, which is the P, phosphorus will be high at the first application stage to encourage root growth. So we have the four stages of fertilizer application. Molding of ginger, rhizomes must be planted on ridges to produce good quality ginger. This makes the molding operation easier and less time consuming. Molding should begin when shoots are approximately one foot high and should continue every two months throughout the life of the crop. The ginger rhizome develops a greenish color when exposed to sunlight because of the development of chlorophyll. Molding is therefore recommended. Soil should be periodically tilled in the plant row to ensure vertical growth. This would overcome tendency of the ginger to grow horizontally. This is ginger exposed to sunlight here, developing a greenish color. Pesticide management for ginger. In Trinidad, the major pests in ginger are cutworms, root knot nematodes. The cut, cutworms damage shoots as they emerge and the root knot nematodes the, the, if the plants are infested with that, they become stunted. Small water-soaked lesions may appear in the rhizome and further destruction of tissues caused by other organisms. So we have, this is a field here being sprayed with, with, with the um, pesticide. You can see someone spraying it on the crop. 
management and control of cutworms and nematodes. Select healthy pest-free planting material. Soak the planting material in systemic insecticide or nematicide solution for 10 minutes, drain and then plant. Practice proper field sanitation and crop rotation. Treat the soil before planting and while the crop is growing with a soil acting insecticide or nematicide. When using chemicals, always follow a manufacturer's recommendation as listed on the labels. Follow the application rate and the pre-harvest intervals. That is the time between last pesticide application and the harvest of the treated crops. So the pre-harvest interval is very important when um, These, these pictures show you the damage on the ginger rhizome caused by cutworms. And we see the, the damage on the inside as well. Disease management in ginger. The major diseases that affect ginger are bacterial wilt, bacterial soft rot and fusarium rhizome rot. So the bacterial wilt can be seen, shown in the picture here, where the, the, the leaves are affected. And we see soft rot, bacterial soft rot on the rhizome here. The soil management of ginger, carrying out proper field sanitation and crop rotation selecting healthy disease-free planting material, soaking the planting material in copper-based fungicide solution for 10 minutes, draining and then planting, treating the soil before planting and while the crop is growing with a soil acting fungicide. Soil fungicide treatments must be carried out every two months or according to the manufacturer's recommendation maintaining proper drainage in the field using clean water to irrigate fields. So we see the field here again of ginger and the proper soil management is, is highly recommended. Harvesting ginger, it is harvested manually using garden fork. The crop can be harvested at two stages of maturity, young or mature. The average yields are 8,000 to 10,000 kilograms per hectare, or for small varieties, 4,000 to 5,000 kilograms per hectare. The young ginger is referred to the rhizome harvested at an early stage between five to seven months after planting. At this stage, this stage rhizome has not developed high fiber content. However, young ginger dehydrates easily and should be protected from direct sun. This ginger is not recommended to be used as planting material since it dries out quickly and doesn't produce good quality shoots. Mature ginger is harvested at eight to nine months after planting. At this stage, the foliage or leaves turn yellow and starts falling to the ground and the rhizomes are firm and glossy. Post-harvest handling of ginger, Ginger must be harvested at the mature stage at eight to nine months to extend shelf life and maintain quality. Harvested ginger must be placed in cool areas away from direct sunlight. Exposure to sunlight scorches the ginger and increases heat within the produce. Remove soil from around the rhizome, wash with clean water, air dry in a well-ventilated shaded area and then allow for the curing process to take place. Place rhizomes on racks in a well-ventilated room for three to five days to allow all exposed tissues to heal and become firm before it is sold. This process is referred to as curing. So this is the harvested ginger in the field. This is a cost of production and in Trinidad, Ginger has a high cost of production. It is a very good, um, it brings a, a lot of um, profits and we see 50,000 
is the cost of production per hectare. The basic activities are again, land preparation, then um, manure, um, uh, um, application of manure, then fertilizer application, pest and disease control, weed control and harvesting. Tanya cultivation, this is also known, uh, um, another name is Kokoyam. The origin of the crop is listed as, uh, um, as the American tropics, that's the origin. Both the leaves and the, the tubers are eaten, but in the Caribbean, tubers are the preferred part of the plant that is eaten. The tubers are said to contain an irritant substance of calcium oxalate, and saponins, which are destroyed in cooking. Tanya is traded mainly in ethnic markets in the North America, United Kingdom. And we have in the Caribbean, the, 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 um, in the Caribbean, we have these tubers also grown, being grown. The land preparation of the Tanya we see in the diagram Tanya grows best in well-drained, easily cultivated soils with no water logging and quick runoff after rains. The site selected should not have, should not have been cultivated with Tanya immediately before, particularly if the crop was diseased. The crop is generally grown on slopes and it is recommended to make ridges along contours about 45 centimeters high and 20 centimeters deep. Planting in mounds is not advised since they do not provide adequate aeration and free drainage, which allows for efficient production of corns. So we see it is planted here on this land, which is, but the mounds must not be too high. The varieties of Tanya, there are two main types. This, and they both have smooth skin purple leaf petioles and purple flesh. And then they have green petioles and white flesh. So this is the white flesh tanya that is very um, pop popular in Trinidad. Selecting the planting material for tanya, tanya acts as a host for the burning leaf disease. Care should be taken to ensure that plant planting material affected with the burning leaf disease is not selected since this disease causes rapid decline and death of plants. Planting materials should be obtained from the tops sprouting combs or cormels of healthy plants and the planting material should be cleaned of all roots and washed off of all soil. Damaged combs or planting material with any signs of decay should be discarded. Planting material should be dipped in fungicide for 15 to 30 minutes before planting to control pathogens which cause burning disease of tanya. Fungicides include Rhydomil or Rizolex at a rate of 30 grams per gallon of water or Carbendazem at a rate of five to 10 grams per, per gallon of water. So we have the tanya combs shown in the photo, and this is the plant as shown. Cormels of tanya as planting material. The combs can be sprouted in moist mulch before planting. The sprouted comb can be cut into pieces, each with at least one growing bud eye. Sprouting cormels should have their roots trimmed, excess cormel cut away, and one or two of the leaves removed. We use the main comb as planting material is, is recommended. The main comb is cut into small pieces, each bearing one or two eyes. Each flesh is excess flesh is removed to prevent rotting. And these pieces can be planted directly in the prepared holes. When the material is scarce, the pieces can be multiplied using mini setting techniques. Tanya planting material, the tops, sprouted combs, and suckers can be used in propagating tanias. So these are the suckers used to form the planting material. 
The suckers and tops give higher yields than the comels. So damaged combs and planting material showing signs of decay should be discarded. Planting material should only be taken from healthy, vigorous plants. And disease-free planting material could now be produced by tissue culture, which results in even higher yields. Planting the tanya, this is the field of tanya being grown. Tanya can be planted year round. Adequate water is, however, necessary for efficient growth. Planting usually coincides with beginning of the rains, May or June, and the crop is also planted September and November when there's some in some islands as well. Plants are normally spaced 60 to 90 centimeters along ridges and sprouted cones should be covered with two centimeters of soil, while the tops and suckers are planted to a depth of six to seven centimeters. Tanya is often intercropped with black eyed peas or, well, in Trinidad, we can intercrop with the pigeon peas, okro, and corn. The intercrop is normally planted after the tanya. These are the tanya combs shown in the picture. Fertilizing of tanya, apply 60 grams triple superphosphate to the planting hole. Usually there are two applications of 16824 NPK at two weeks after planting, then again at six weeks after planting. The first application is in approximately five grams per plant and the second at 10 grams per plant. So this is the, the fertilizer as shown. Pest and disease management of tanya. The most serious tanya disease is called leaf burning disease or root rot disease. And the, the photo is showing you the, the diagram of the leaf burning disease. This is a crop here without any disease as shown in the, in the, in the photo. Harvesting tanya, the smooth white variety of tanya usually matures in approximately eight to 11 months after planting. The smooth purple tanya is later maturing than the white tanya. Harvested cornels should be washed after harvest. These are harvested tubers of white tanya. Irish potato, well, this is a very recent trial that is being done in Trinidad because we don't normally grow this, but it has now started. Trials are being done at National Seed Bank in Chagaramas to see if one of the country's most popular vegetables, the Irish root crops, the Irish potato, can successfully be grown in Trinidad. Similar trials have had been done in the 1980s. It was in the 1980s that the Carney Limited undertook trials to produce locally grown Irish potato, and, but they were unsuccessful. 40 years later, though, after crossing various hurdles, the process is again being undertaken by staff of National Seed Bank and Caribbean Chemicals Limited for planting five Irish potato varieties on trial plots in Shagaramas. So, this is the Irish potato, as you see, and the, the trials are presently on the way. It's presently ongoing. And these are the, the sprouted um, Irish potato, and the, the tractor is, is um, preparing the land. Here we have land preparation, and these are trials presently ongoing in the, in the National seed bank, seed bank. So we have these sprouted um, Irish potato, which will be planted on the field in Shagaramas. The cultural practices for Irish potato, these varieties were developed for conditions similar to ours, and one has already been commercialized in Jamaica. In a few months, we will see the results before moving on to larger plots. The four varieties being tested in Trinidad 
and a similar trial is being undertaken with a private farmer in East Trinidad. Irish potatoes are known as a cool weather crop. And according to um, the almanac calendar, almanac.com, the traditional Irish potato prefer cool weather in well-drained loose soil between seven to 13 degrees Celsius. There are more than a hundred varieties of potatoes. And the Irish potato are also grown in Jamaica and Guyana. So Irish potato is, is our latest trial that is under, being undergone in Trinidad for root crop cultivation. So that's about it for root crops. And we have discussed eight, eight, variety, eight types of root crops. And, and we, we know that this is the Lenten season and normally root crops is one of the favorite foods prepared for Good Friday, which is next week Friday. And therefore it is quite appropriate to, to have this webinar, you know, um, in preparation for Good Friday and for Easter. So this is, um, if, if anyone would like to ask questions pertaining to the root crops, please feel free. And um, I see I have some questions. Would, would ginger also apply for saffron and turmeric? Yeah, saffron and turmeric, those are similar rhizomes. So that, that is a type of rhizome, saffron. I don't, I don't know if trials have, have been done in, in Trinidad for that, but I know ginger is, is grown in abundance in Trinidad and it, it, it gives quite high yields and high um, profits for production. Are there any more questions at all? Anyone is, would, be, would like to ask anything? Right, well, we're just about seven o'clock and we, uh, we will love to see, have you all again at our next webinar. And you will be given the link again for the next web agriculture webinar. And I hope you enjoyed the topic on root crops. We, lots of, a lot of us didn't, aren't aware of the, the number of root crops we have in Trinidad and especially the Irish potato, which is the most recent one we have started in Trinidad. And we, we should, we should be um, getting good results with, with respect to that. So I thank you all for listening and uh, I, you were very encouraging listening and viewing audience. And I look forward to seeing all of you again in the next couple of weeks. Okay, I thank you and good night. I see, are there some questions?